Hello and Hare Krishna. It is Ryan here, uh, aka Ramananda Das by some. And we're very fortunate on today's Chasing Reality podcast to be joined by Professor Dennis Noble from the University of Oxford. I have very much enjoyed his writings over the last few years since I've come to know about him, taking great inspiration. Uh, in a sense, I wish I'd only, um, my, my only wish is I'd known about his thoughts earlier in my scientific career before I got out of working in the lab. Um, we're, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. Uh, he's, he's the writer of two main books from 2006, The Music of Life, and 2016, Dance to the Tune of Life, Biological Relativity. I very much recommend you picking them up because they're a great read, um, very easy to read and very, very um, important books. So thank you very much, Professor Dennis Noble, for joining me today on this Chasing Reality podcast. Um, I'm actually very honoured. I've been following your work closely over the last few years. I've read both of your books, uh, right. The Music of Life in 2006 and 2016, um, Biological Relativity, Dance to the Tune of Life. And I found them very refreshing. Very thank much. you. Um, right. <laughs> I noticed that you're you're part of a group online called the Third Way of Evolution. Exactly so. And I just wanted you to tell me a little bit about this, maybe in terms of the history, the biology, and why do we need, what is it and why do we need such a thing? We shouldn't need it at all. Okay. That's a short answer, but there's a longer answer, obviously, because there's a long history to this. And I'm afraid it goes all the way back to 1883. Charles Darwin died in 1882, so he would not have known what happened very soon after his death. Mm -hmm. Because in 1883, August Weissmann, a great German geneticist, um, well, I describe him as a geneticist, actually... Of course, genetics, and certainly not DNA, was not known in the way that we know it today. Sure. But he was concerned with inheritance. And August Weissmann took Darwin's ideas, and he was shocked by parts of Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. His shock was that Darwin, in about 12 places in The Origin of Species, accepts... Lamarck's ideas on the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Mm. August Weissman was of the view that there is no way in which the body, the soma, could influence the germline. That idea is what we now call Weissman's barrier. Okay. Now, it's often thought that Darwin must have agreed with that. He certainly did not because not only in the origin of species does he refer in 12 places to accepting Lamarck's idea, he also developed a theory for how it could happen. It's in one of the later books, The Domestication of Animals and Plants. And what he said was, I think there must be tiny particles that go through the fluids of the body and can influence the germline. He okay. called them gemmules. His gemules are what we now call exosomes. We know that exosomes go straight down to the germline. The DNA in them, the RNA in them, can get incorporated into the fused egg and sperm. It can get incorporated into the genome. That's all been demonstrated, uh, actually, by one of the third-way scientists, Corrado Spadafora, uh, in Rome. Now, why am I giving you this little bit of history over, what is it now, 130 years old, because it's crucial. Weissmann's idea was never debated with Darwin, because after all, Darwin passed away a year before he presented it in a great lecture. But it formed the cornerstone of the main theory of evolutionary biology today, which is called the modern synthesis, sometimes also called neo-Darwinism. And for those who don't know very much about the academic aspects of biology, a good way to sum that up is that it is what Richard Dawkins describes in The Selfish Gene. 
Now, we've known actually for a long time that many aspects of that idea must be wrong. 70 years ago, at least, Barbara McClintock, who was working on plants, who was actually working on Indian corn, mm -hmm. showed that under stress, the plant could transfer bits of genetic material from one chromosome to another. The plant was effectively saying, of course, I don't mean consciously, mm -hmm. but it was effectively saying, I'm under stress. Let's see what happens if I just shuffle my cards. Let's see if I can get a different solution to the problem of responding to the stress. Okay, I see. And she, she was told in 1957, I think it was, that her discovery should not be referred to in the papers she was publishing because nobody believed her. 1983, I think it was, at the age of 81, she won the Nobel Prize for what we now call mobile genetic elements. Now, the reason I'm saying all of this is that actually we have known that there are major breaks in relation to the Weissmann barrier for a very long time. So why have people not admitted it? You won't find what I've just described in most of the textbooks of evolutionary biology. You certainly won't find the way in which DNA can pass from sperm to egg. And indeed, egg cells can also pick up DNA from the fluids of the body and RNAs which control the DNA. Mm -hmm. The reason why we formed the Third Way of Evolution website, which now has something like 60 or 70 uh, senior people, all of them published books and major articles on evolutionary biology, is that as a group, we found it very strange to be faced with this situation in which it's been known for a long time that the simple assumptions of neo-Darwinism, or what's called the model synthesis, cannot be sufficient on their own, yet you don't find this taught in schools, you don't find it in the textbooks. And until recently, it was also quite dangerous even to go public, as I've done now for more than 12 years, um, with doubts and serious doubts about the modern synthesis and what we now call neo-Darwinism. So there was no other way to make sure that other academics and the public know that there's a very substantial group of us who wish to see research on evolutionary biology open up to the mm. new trends which are very important but which are also old trends because as i said they were found many years ago they've been ignored thank you that's a that's a very comprehensive um answer to my question it's it's something that i i, I feel very strongly about because i was taught through those textbooks which you're talking about and nowhere did i see anything like this yeah um, that's right and, and you bring that point out because i actually think things will only change when the textbooks change well that's one of my questions actually dennis how, how do textbooks change i'm a bit naive to this process of how it, academia interacts with the process of of um you know teaching outside in schools and colleges how, and, and universities how, how does that happen is there a particular process or, or or is it just whatever seems in vogue gets picked up by you know? yeah that's a very good and very deep question of course if what you're doing is advancing science in what i might call an incremental way it's not too difficult for textbook writers to adjust and edit their textbooks as they do every five to ten years. So if what you're doing relates already to existing well-established ideas, then I think it's gradual and it's not too difficult. It takes time, of course, for the textbooks to catch up. I think that's reasonable because yeah. some of the developments that are novel just peter out. But this certainly hasn't petered out. So that's not the explanation. Mm. I think the explanation is a, a social and cultural one. And it is this. 
maybe the people who might listen to this podcast will not know the nature of the situation in the United States, but let me just briefly describe it, because I work in the United States as well as here in the UK quite frequently. Okay. I collaborate with a lot of United States uh, uh, people. The debate over evolution over there is hotly contested in a way that we don't really see here in Europe. Um, it's contested, of course, by very strongly fundamentalist Christians. Mm -hmm. Now, I respect their faith. I've no quarrel with that. What I find very difficult to understand is their position in relation to science, because apart from strongly fundamentalist groups here in the United Kingdom and perhaps also in Europe, there are very few people now who seriously challenge the general theory of evolution. That is that organisms are developed from other organisms. Yes. And you don't find the Archbishop of Canterbury um, questioning that idea. You don't find the leaders of other churches and religious groups challenging that idea in a serious way. In the United States, you do. And I know middle America as well as the east and west coast. And you'll be surprised the extent to which just talking with ordinary people um, in relation to this question of whether they think we have or have not evolved from other animals, the very large numbers who think that cannot possibly be true. Now, I think that puts the evolutionary biologists in the United States in a very particular social situation, which we need to understand, yes. which is that many of them have also used evolutionary biology to attack religion. Now, that's, that's their right. That's fine. Again, I've no particular quarrel with that, though I wouldn't wish to be involved with that myself. But the consequence is that the stakes are very high. Mm -hmm. This is a, a very hot issue in the United States. It's not a hot issue in the same way in Europe. Now, it's not a surprise, therefore, that when I organized a meeting on new trends in evolutionary biology at the top academy of science here in the United Kingdom and the top academy of humanities and social sciences here, that is the Royal Society and the British Academy, three years ago in 2016, I received the information that evolutionary biologists in the United Kingdom were worried about this meeting because they had received messages from colleagues in the United States saying, this is a disaster. How can a meeting like this be organized by somebody who openly challenges neo-Darwinism in his lectures? That's me, Dennis. I see. Okay. Now, this I think gives us an insight in what is going on. It is not just a matter of the science. This is a matter of a very hot and lively debate that is still occurring in the United States and which I think has polarized the issue to the point at which it seems to me the writers of the textbook simply don't risk, if that's the right way to put it, mm -hmm. uh, putting those new trends out. There's a kind of community of people who defend the fortress, if I might put it that way, of neo-Darwinism. I've never in my long career in science encountered anything like it. I've had controversies in my own field of physiological science, but I've never encountered a situation where there's a kind of dogmatism in reverse. Mm -hmm. The dogmatism here is that the neo-Darwinist synthesis must be protected, must be regarded as absolute, because we've told the religious right in the United States that it is absolute and absolutely certain. Now, that's my amateur sociological analysis of what has gone on. And I think it's not, therefore, um, just a coincidence that the major opposition to a meeting here in the United Kingdom, which incidentally was very successful, highly attended, and with a, a very good publication that came out from it. Yes. It's not a coincidence that the opposition came from the United States. There is a fear there, I think, on the part of standard evolutionary biologists that if they admit that they were wrong, the religious right will be, 
well, to put a, 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 a usual phrase on it, laughing down their beards. <laughs> now, I think they're wrong to think that. Um, I, I mean, science is science, and it should advance according to what the evidence shows. But there is my somewhat amateur sociological analysis of what I think has happened, but I have direct experience of it, because as I said, I, I live and work sometimes in the United States with colleagues there. I know middle America where all of this is rampant, um, uh, and I therefore know that I'm partly right. Whether it's the whole explanation, I really can't say. Thank you. That's that's very very helpful, and the the way you looked at that from the the, the standpoint of um, the European uh, socio political environment versus the United States, um, it it raises a question in me. <laughs> yes. Which which oh. is which is that I can imagine even in that kind of an environment where you're holding on, where someone's holding on to uh, the neo Darwinist. Um, viewpoint very strongly small changes could be accepted perhaps yeah so so my question is what is what what is the fear the fear must be coming from something that seems like a radical shift that's needed and so i i was wondering what it is that's being proposed that, that could be um put in place instead of neo-darwinism or, or maybe something tagged onto it well these are very good questions um <clears throat> First of all, it is true to say that um, neo-Darwinists in the United States have, of course, accepted quite a lot of the developments and changes that have occurred, and which show that the modern synthesis or neo-Darwinism is not itself sufficient, as it was formulated roughly 70 years ago. So you're quite right, there are many biologists in the United States who would say, okay, we have extended the theory. Isn't that sufficient for you? So your question is a very good one. Why do I think it is not sufficient? I think that is best explained by asking the question, how has neo-Darwinism been presented to the public? I'm not talking now about academics talking at academic meetings where what I've just said would be readily accepted. Yes, we've extended the theory, we've added this, we've added that, no problem. I'm talking about how it is perceived by the general public. And sadly, the books that have the great influence there are Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene and Dan Danette's Darwin's Dangerous Idea, both of which give no hint whatsoever that these changes have occurred mm -hmm. and these developments have occurred. That is the problem. So I find that when I discuss with particularly, no longer among scientists, among scientists, much of what I say is just so, they say, well, what's the problem, Dennis? You know, <laughs> all of this is obvious. <laughs> um, but with the, the general public, there's a very different situation. And not only the general public, incidentally, with people working in the social sciences like economics and sociology, yes. who are now using genomics, incidentally, in order to study sociology. I mean, what they do, of course, is very close to the dangerous idea of can we characterize people by their genomes? And can we then start asking the dangerous question, are there good genomes and bad genomes? And how do you... <laughs> correct the bad ones. And, I mean, this is, it is highly dangerous. And we've seen that with the outrage, of, of course, that came uh, from experiments in China on children and babies to actually change the genome in the embryonic uh, stage or in the earlier than the embryonic stage, which, of course, nearly all scientists around the world condemned as far too dangerous um, because, of course, it would affect generations to come. Now, the point I think I'm making here is that the change needs to be in the popular presentation of evolutionary biology. Moreover, I'd go further and say that the view that I'm expressing, which is that the language of neo-Darwinism is part of the problem, would produce 
a view of evolutionary biology which is much softer, much more nuanced. Instead of, for example, genes created as body and mind, that's a direct quote from the selfish gene, I would say we control our genes. We are the medium through which our culture, our environment, our interrelations with other people, with other organisms, influence through the, well, no longer doubted control of the genome. The genome is controlled by the organism itself. Outside a cell, a DNA sequence can do nothing whatsoever. That's why viruses are not alive. They've got mm. to go into a cell in order to use the cell's machinery to reproduce. So just taking that one example, genes created as body and mind, well, it's simply wrong. It's not a matter of nuancing it. It's incorrect. Moreover, and I'm, I'm sure Richard Dawkins would agree with this point, to attribute selfishness to a piece of a molecule <laughs> is very odd. <laughs> you know, you and I can be selfish. <laughs> I wish I have that inclination. <laughs> but my poor DNA can't be selfish. And indeed, a few years ago, I published an article showing that it's actually an empty hypothesis. The only way you could test selfishness for a sequence in a bit of DNA is to find out whether it succeeds in reproducing better than its competitors in future generations. So the very term selfish gene, the only way to sort of ask the question, you know, can we show that this gene is selfish, is to find out whether its frequency in the subsequent generations increases. Now that may seem obvious, and of course to readers of the selfish gene, it does seem obvious. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's philosophically speaking, an empty statement, because what is the experiment you could do to test that idea? You first define a selfish gene perhaps as the genes that are successful in the future generations increasing their numbers, but what's the test for that? It is, do they increase their numbers? You can't have a hypothesis whose main definition of its key component in the hypothesis is the very thing that would enable you to make a prediction. The prediction can't itself be the definition. I mean, it's a philosophical point, but it's an obvious one. So I think the difficulty lies, and this is why I think we need a, a revolution in our thinking about mm. evolution biology. I think the problem lies in the language that has been used. It's metaphorical. People sometimes criticize me for using metaphors. I have openly done that with the music of life and the, the new one, Dance to the Tune of Life. The fact is, though, if you read them carefully and you go towards the end of my book, the music of life, what I say at the end is this. The reason for introducing that metaphor is to compare it with the alternative metaphor, that is, genes created as body and mind. What I'm demonstrating is you can let go of your metaphors. You don't have to be taken in by them. You don't have to believe them. You can use them. Metaphors are there to be used. Mm -hmm. and what I'm really saying, therefore, is not believe my metaphor rather than somebody else's. It is remember that metaphors are just metaphors. And you've got to then ask the question, what do they do? What do they make you think? The best move then is to say, okay, give up the metaphors and just look at what the facts are. The facts are why the third wave evolution was formed, because all the people on that website are very concerned about people ignoring the facts that have been discovered uh, over quite a long period of time, but which are now accumulating in a very rapid way. Yes, and that <clears throat> what I'm picking up as you're speaking is is that there's a real resurgence of the idea of organisms, the return of the organism is is the yeah. way that I understand it. And instead of the, the organism is in control, yes, That's right. yes. And that, that... I mean, not entirely so, because obviously, you know, somebody's got cystic fibrosis, that, that is a genetic disorder, no question about it. There sure. are certain uh, forms of genetic uh, change that you can do nothing about other than 
perhaps have a drug that helps you with coping with it, possibly also some degree of, of gene therapy. Obviously, I don't disagree with that. But generally, the interesting thing is that most changes in the genome don't have much effect. The, the genome-wide association studies have shown that. The correlations between uh, particular genes and function is not extremely strong in most cases. You have to accumulate the correlations with a large number of genes before you arrive at a good possible uh, genetic component. Let me just take one example of that. Look at athletes and ask, what is it that makes a really good athlete? Now, you might think, okay, they've got to have the genes for being a good athlete. And I agree with that. Don't disagree with that. If you've got a cystic fibrosis problem, you certainly won't be a terribly good athlete. Yeah, so yeah. in certain respects, it must be true. It is obviously true. But when you do the analysis, do you find a few genes that can be able to explain why you've got a top athlete rather than somebody who couldn't even run a mile? The answer is no. What you find is hundreds of correlated, and each of them with a fairly small degree of correlation. What does that tell us? It tells us that we're not, as it were, uh, fully determined in that kind of way. And you can demonstrate that. There are lovely studies now looking at identical twins. Why do that? Because they've got the same genome. More or less, the, there can be a bit of change of genome uh, following the fusion of egg and sperm. But generally speaking, you can say that identical twins have got similar genomes. I, I'm uh, just about to publish a paper reproducing a beautiful picture that was made, oh, goodness me, I think at least 60 years ago now, of two identical twins, one of whom trained as a weightlifter, the other trained as a runner. Their body physique is totally different. Hmm. The runner has got fantastic leg muscles and is very thin at the top because he doesn't need to carry a big weight. Yes. Uh, in his running. That's how he can go fast because he's, uh, he's not loaded up too much. The weightlifter, my goodness, his arms are so strong, his chest <laughs> so strong. <laughs> and, and by comparison, his legs, of course, they've got to be moderately strong, but the real strength is, is up here, of course. The, the fact is that uh, what we found there is that when you study the difference, this is modern studies now rather than that particular one that was done about 60 years ago, modern studies of um, identical twins in relation to athletic performance, exercise-related performance, show right down at the level of the RNAs that control the genome, the RNAs are different. Wow. Now, that's because somebody decided to become an athlete. Yes. That's not because his genes made him decide that. Because the genes, they say, are the same. Again, what, what I'm describing here as facts are, when you think about it, fairly obvious. Uh, so, again, I'm puzzled by the, apart from my sociological analysis of the big debates in the United States over evolution, I'm very puzzled by why it is there has been so much resistance to these very obvious facts. Now, I come to a very interesting fact, but it's a sociological fact now, not a scientific fact. That was true up to about the time of the Royal Society meeting in 2016, that there was a huge amount of public resistance. Yes. Gone completely silent. For the last three years, I've been lecturing all over the place, in the United States, in Europe, in East Asia, almost everywhere. I was for a number of years president of the International Union of my subject, Physiological Sciences. And I find that all the oppositions disappeared. I don't get seriously difficult questions anymore. What I get is, OK, what experiment should I be doing? Wow, that's very nice. <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? You see, I'll just give one example. It was from an experimental biology meeting in the United States. It's huge. This is the grand jamboree of maybe 10,000. It's a huge number of people from all the biological sciences. And one of the plenary lecturers gave a lovely lecture on what 
biochemical changes occur in muscle <coughs> during exercise. And it was training rats. You see, the, the rats were either trained to run on treadmills or they were not. Uh, so he could then look, again, because these were cloned, okay. similar genomes, he could look at uh, the extent to which the biochemical changes, including, of course, RNAs, could change as a consequence of exercise in those that were exercising compared to those that were not. And he found many changes, many biochemical changes. That fits what I said earlier on about the other modern studies of, um, of twins in the case of humans. But these are rats or mice. I can't remember which now. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, you've got a colony which is identical genetically with another colony, but the difference is simply the exercise. Have you thought of breeding from them? Now, initially, the penny didn't drop. He couldn't mm. see why I was asking that question. And then he suddenly said, my God, do you think that's really worth doing? Of course, this is Lamarckism. This yeah. is the idea that if you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the poor blacksmith, you know, uses his arms all the time to hammer the, the stuff, <laughs> make his, his, his iron bits and pieces. Um, would that pass on to his children? I don't know. I still don't know the answer to that question. But that person could do it. He could find out whether in animals it works. Now, why doesn't he? First of all, he didn't even think of it. You see, mm -hmm. he said, my God, is that? even worth doing <laughs> oh my goodness it's worth doing yes yeah. there are many examples now of paternal and and maternal effects that pass down the generations amongst physiologists that's not even questioned anymore is established fact that there are great transgenerational passings of the lifestyle affecting of, of the parent affecting the uh, propensity to disease and health of the offspring. And we now know some of the mechanisms, of course. We know, to go back to Darwin, his Gemmules idea, uh, we know that there are little packets. They're so tiny you can't see them under the light microscope. You need electron microscopes to see them that carry um, information from the soma to the germline. So we know that the Weissman barrier, which is the idea that the germline is sacrosanct and not in any way influenced by the soma, is clearly broken. The, the Weissman barrier is no longer a barrier. So we've no longer any difficulty in explaining why all of those um, maternal and, and, uh, and, and paternal effects get passed down through the generations. What's Still, though, an interesting fact is that I think if you put a research grant proposal in to do the experiment I suggested to that American scientist who was giving mm -hmm. a lecture of the experimental biology, <laughs> the chances are that people will say, oh, that's a way out experiment. It's not worth doing. Anyway, we know that Lamarckism is a lot of old rubbish, you see, so don't even do it. Don't even bother well, so it is that there is that there are fashions in science, of course. There's no doubt about that, and and committees uh, are influenced by that as much as, of course, by the science itself. So, I this comes back to another reason why we formed the Third Way. We thought it was very important to give the message, particularly to young scientists, that um, it is worth doing these experiments. Of course, they may not work. Of course, we don't know the answer. That's why you do them. Yes. I don't know whether it will upset <laughs> standard evolutionary biology. But what do you do with theories? You, you, you test them to destruction. That's the way science works. And I'm intrigued by the fact that younger people I talk to now are looking at doing precisely such experiments. That's greatly encouraging for me. It's very exciting for me as well. I, I wish um, I'm I'm out of the lab now. I've been out for a number of years. I've starting in a different career, but I wish wow. I'd um, had your 
your influence while I was I was there. I was <laughs> I was an well, exposed. You're echoing what I find amongst young people now. You see, where where I go as I lecture around the world is that I find that I get young people. Um, and not so young, <laughs> but people still with active laboratories coming up to me and saying, well, what is worth doing? You know, is what I'm doing a, a way of trying to test the, the ideas and test them to destruction? The key message from the third way, I think, is this, that nature is more wonderful than we imagined. Mm. It uses processes that we didn't even think could happen. <laughs> and so there's a huge amount of great work there to be done. It'll be Nobel Prize winning work if people can do it. So that's my main message to the young. And it's what I find as a reaction around the world as I lecture. I get people asking me, you know, what exactly is now worth doing? Thank you very much, Dennis. It's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Cause, and I think that's a good note to end on. It's a very encouraging yeah. um, yes. I like to end on encouraging notes because I, <laughs> I, I'm sometimes presented as a fairly old sort of, well, I am old, incidentally, <laughs> a disgruntled chap. I'm not really. I'm actually very positive. And I've been, uh, I've been very positive throughout my career, but I've been very, very surprised by the reactions that occurred in the early part of the mm. 2000s when I first started publishing openly my dissent <laughs> by <laughs> first of all the reactions which were essentially his the, the latest moronic <laughs> attempt to discredit neo-darwinism <laughs> but i'm now very encouraged indeed by the fact that the reaction from young people is what are the good experiments to do and there are many well i i appreciate your your inspiration and and the fact you've persisted it's yes. it's you know, hopefully, I'm sure it will inspire a um, a whole new generation of scientists who consider, like you said, na nature as as a wonderful thing and something worth um, really trying to get to grips of with. And not, I mean, the idea of reductionism, obviously, in itself, of reducing things isn't isn't necessarily an issue when you study things in isolation. But as a philosophy, that you have to look at life that way. You've um, got it. It's, it's the studying things in isolation that is the problem. Mm -hmm. You've also then got to go back. Reductionism is fine. If you do that, that's great. But you've also got to go back and ask, how does it work in the real organism? Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Professor Dennis Noblen. And I hope we can speak again sometime in the future. Okay. I'd be delighted to come back in a year or two when you've got some reactions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye <laughs> right, for now then. See you, Dennis. Okay, so thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the podcast episode today with Professor Dennis Noble as much as I did. I'm very thankful to him for giving such a, a lively, exciting and memorable um, account of the history of evolutionary theory and how... What I take away is the main message, which is that organisms are reducible to their parts. Ultimately, organisms are in control of their own genetic material. And it seems to me as if their desires, the desire of the organism um, manifests in the use of the various different molecular toolkit that the body consists of. And obviously there's many layers of this down from cells up to organs and the organism. So it, it, it seems to me that Dennis is saying that organisms, based on what they want to do, they ultimately use their bodies in that way so that they can try and fulfill the, their aims. Now, it doesn't always work out because there are restrictions. Just like if you've got a motorbike, you can drive 100 miles an hour. But if you've got a restrictor on it, you can only maybe go 60 miles an hour if you're learning or something. Similarly, certain genetic mutations can cause restrictions on how much we can use or enjoy our body in certain ways. However, um, generally, the rule is that organisms are in control and our molecular toolkit follows suit. So I'm looking forward to asking some more questions, Dennis, and hopefully 
have us in the third way of evolution in the future. And please stay tuned. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.